Hold on because we're going to take you on an amazing trip around the big planet. Starting with a very chilly dive into the Tiber River in Italy. We travel to Argentina to see a ballet troupe that is about to take on the world. And we check out what's hot in the toy world for kids. And for bigger kids. Our first stop today is Italy, where there are some stray cats that have become so much a part of the ruins in Rome that they're about to be declared part of its history. Rome is Italy's capital city, and more than 100 cats have made their home amongst Rome's ancient ruins. In fact, these magnificent moggies have just discovered that they're about to be declared a biocultural heritage by the Council of Rome. This means that these cats are now protected by the Council, and the people of Rome must look after them as if they were their own pets. These cats are taking life in a pretty relaxed fashion, and they don't care who knows about it. There's quite a lot of sunbathing going on around the Roman temples of Torre Argentina, an archaeological site in the very centre of Rome. The only battle they have to worry about is of constantly looking their best. As far as they're concerned, their role as a major tourist attraction is incredibly important and people come from all over the world just to look at them. Cats of all kinds have always lived in the shadows of the ancient ruins of Rome, which is why the council thought it was so important to protect them. But it's the Cat Keeper, or the Gatara, organised by voluntary organisations, who puts in the real work of feeding and caring for the famed felines. They hope that the people who come to visit will be inspired by what they are doing, and maybe even adopt a kitten. Unfortunately, some people do just the opposite. They actually come to the ruins to abandon their cats there. Meal times are certainly a family affair, but there's only time for a quick break before returning to their adoring public. Some of Rome's residents love the idea that their cats will be protected in this way. They believe that to see them as a national monument is a little over the top, but that they should be protected and looked after because they're part of Rome. But there are some people who just don't see the point. They're afraid that the cats could only damage the archaeological site, believing that while they may be a nice attraction for the children, they really do make a lot of mess. Lucky for these cats, most people love them. The cats are taking it all in their stride, but would like to make a few requests. Definitely no dogs, and perhaps the traffic couldn't try and make a little less noise. Who said it was a dog's life, really? Some people can think of nothing better than to start the new year by plunging off a bridge into icy cold water. <laughs> These brave divers choose to perform this very daring feat in front of hundreds of people. It's hard to believe that so many Romans brave the chill on this New Year's morning. They couldn't wait to get to the Cava Bridge in Rome to watch the traditional New Year's Day dive into the Tiber River. At noon, the divers flung themselves off the 16-metre-high bridge into the swirling, muddy river that winds through Rome. At least they picked the warmest time of day to do it. One at a time, these plucky fellows leapt into the river. And it looks like at least one of them just couldn't wait to get out again. I don't blame them, do you? And with a very graceful dive, our third man is in the water. He looks like he's had a lot of practice at this, doesn't he? He dedicates his dive to something each time he goes for the plunge, and this time he's doing it for peace. Spectators crowded onto the bridge, on the riverbanks, and on little boats to cheer on the divers. In spite of the cold, they look like they're enjoying the attention. Now it's time to find them some warm clothes. Wow. 
what a beautiful sight. The coral reefs of our big planet are the homes of many unusual and different kinds of animals and plants. We're on the Great Barrier Reef and today we're going to learn about what Mother Nature puts into making the reef itself. A coral reef is a very complex community of many different creatures. Coral and fish, crabs and snails, as well as many different plants. Coral reefs cover less than 1% of the world's ocean, but they hold one quarter of all the different forms of sea creatures. So you can see how important it is to keep coral reefs safe from harm. Did you know that a coral reef is actually made up of thousands of little animals called polyps? Coral polyps have either six or eight tentacles and are very, very small. They use their tentacles to catch food at night and make their own home by building it around themselves. Life on a coral reef starts with one of these little creatures. It lands in a place it wants to call home and begins to grow. Soon it's begun to build a coral and will continue to grow both night and day. As more coral creatures settle nearby, a reef begins to form. Over thousands of years, huge areas such as the Great Barrier Reef have formed. The Great Barrier Reef is the largest coral reef in the world and stretches about 2,000 kilometres along the coast of Queensland in northern Australia. Many thousands of tourists come to the reef each year to snorkel and scuba dive. They're able to see a whole new world underwater that can't be seen anywhere else but on our beautiful planet. Have you ever wondered why the beaches around coral reefs are so white? Well, coral protect themselves by making their home out of a very hard form of white limestone. Parrotfish live in the coral reef and can feed on the coral by biting it with their powerful jaws. This turns the limestone coral into very fine sand and on a single reef, these parrotfish can make tons of sand each year. After a long time, they can eventually create a tropical island. There are hundreds of different types of coral polyps that make up coral and they're able to make them in a beautiful range of colours and shapes. We've only seen a few of them here today. The Australian authorities are making sure that every care is taken to look after this very precious piece of ocean. One of the ways to look after the Great Barrier Reef is to protect it against creatures that may do it some harm. Unfortunately, the Great Barrier Reef has become the home of a very large population of Crown of Thorns starfish. Scientists are puzzled as to the real reason why the crown of thorns starfish is taking over the reef. These starfish love coral, it's their favourite food. Up until about 30 years ago, the crown of thorns starfish was just another animal living in the reef. Now, scientists must come up with a way to save the reef before the starfish eats too much of it. One thought is that pollution from farms may be helping the starfish to grow. The Australian Government is considering making a Great Barrier Reef protection plan to help people stop polluting the reef. According to the World Wildlife Fund, the Great Barrier Reef contains at least 350 types of hard coral and is made up of 2,900 individual reefs. It is greater in area than the United Kingdom. The people of Australia are working very hard to keep the reef safe for many years to come. of the Toba tribe are bringing back an ancient tradition to the modern life of Argentina. For hundreds of years they've been swapping goods with other tribes without the need for money and they're here today to take part in one of the many barter markets that are springing up all over Argentina. Many traditional handmade items are brought to these markets but no money ever changes hands. Native ceramics, woven blankets, straw baskets and bows and arrows are all swapped at the local market. You can find just about everything here including new clothes, shoes and food. 
The tribe has only recently decided to open its doors to outsiders. They're trying to swap handmade articles to feed and clothe the 150 members of their group. Their little market has grown from just 40 stalls to over 200 and is a very popular place to do business. The 32 Toba families on this reserve live in small brick bungalows with steel roofs and concrete floors. Children, mothers and pregnant women and the elderly eat one meal a day in the community's dining room on food donated by the local church. When they have their other daily meals, the food comes from what they're able to swap. Bartering has been around for centuries and it's not just used by the Toba people. It's still used in other parts of the world such as Toba Brand Islands in Melanesia. They have two different kinds of bartering or swapping goods. One is just like the Toba people, swapping for things they need in everyday life. The other is for gift giving, where presents are swapped in a special ceremony. These items are more likely to be what people would like to have and not what they need to live on. But for the Toba people, this market has ended and now it's time to make some more goods to swap at the next market. Hopefully, the people who come to the next market will like what they see and start swapping. This lady is preparing well in advance for her next stall. Wouldn't you like to know what she'd like to swap for her handmade weaving? I guess we'll have to wait and see at the next barter market. We have a star in our midst and his name is Giulio Bocca from Argentina. He is taking his ballet troupe to perform in Italy and for the first time they are also performing in London. Giulio says he wants to show the world that his beloved Argentina and its people are rich in talent and culture. His dance company will perform a series of shows that include classic and modern dances, as well as the daring rhythm of the tango dance. Giulio has already performed in the most famous halls in every continent with his Ballet Argentino. The ballet troupe is a company that Giulio began back in 1990 when he was only 22 years old. He has been a director of the company since 1997. London is the only one of the great capitals of the world where Giulio has not yet performed. Because it is the first time, Giulio is very anxious that the people of London will like his troupe's shows. No other dancing company from Argentina has performed in London, so this makes him nervous as well. After years of hard work, Giulio has succeeded in making his dance company a popular attraction in Argentina. He and his group perform in soccer stadiums and open air festivals, leaving thousands of people fascinated with his show. In London, Giulio will present a mixture of dancers, hoping that everyone will see how talented his group really is. In the future, Giulio plans to include some traditional Argentine dancers so that he can show people what the culture of Argentina is like. Giulio also belongs to the American Ballet Theatre. Since 1987, he has danced every year at the Metropolitan Opera House in New York. When he decides to retire, Giulio will dance his last show in Buenos Aires to say thank you to his loyal fans.
There's a new toy about to hit the shelves of the toy store in Japan and around the world. It's called DigiQ and is a collection of radio controlled toys that are small enough to rest comfortably in the palm of your hand. The toys include a range of tanks, submarines as well as a collection of mini cars which we've seen before. Each car and controller set costs nearly 5,000 yen which is around 37 US dollars and people will be able to buy extra cars for 3,000 yen. The companies involved in making the toys are Konami and the Takara Company. Takara is also the makers of Lika-chan, which is the famous Japanese version of the Barbie doll. But it's Konami that has developed a special kind of technology called Micro IR, which makes it easier to use the remote control device. The toys are also able to move around faster and more easily than before. The trains, tanks, submarines and more automobiles will be released soon and the toy makers say mini radio controlled aeroplanes could be next. While it's mostly children that buy the DigiQ toys, there are a lot of men aged 20 to 30 that also like playing with them. These men are certainly enjoying themselves torpedoing each other in the tank. The Takara company have long been interested in this kind of toy. Way back in the 1980s, they made Kuroku cars. Lots of people collected these cars and they are still traded on the internet. Takara has even built a real car using this technology. They've made a single-seater electric car that can be driven on the road for up to 80 kilometres. It can even travel at speeds of up to 60 kilometres per hour. They've also invented Bao Lingual. It's a special handheld electronic device that can tell you how your dog is feeling. It does this by listening to your dog's bark and then tells you if your dog is sad, tired, bad tempered or just plain happy. What will they come up with next? Two Belgian explorers are making the longest ever unassisted trek across the North Pole. Elaine Hubert and Dixie Danseker are setting out from Russia's New Siberian Islands and are headed for a place called Ward Hut in Canada. This is a total of 2,400 kilometres, which is 700 kilometres longer than anyone has ever tried before. These very brave explorers have already crossed Antarctica in 1997 using power sails. They are hoping that the weather and winds will be just right so that they can use their powerful sail system to speed their way into Canada. When they were in Antarctica, they travelled almost 4,000 kilometres. Nearly 300 kilometres of that was by sail, and that made the trip much easier for them. Looks kind of fun, doesn't it? Speaking from St. Petersburg in Russia, the two explorers told reporters that they would have to be on the lookout for many dangers on their trip. Blizzards are just one of them, but curious polar bears are a more unusual problem. It is possible that the bears might mistake them for food. Mm. The explorers will have to carry all of their supplies in sleds, so it's very important that they pack carefully and as light as possible. Even so, they will each be towing a sled that is expected to weigh around 180 kilograms. They are especially worried about how cold it will be. At the beginning of the expedition, it will be very chilly and the land won't get much light from the sun during winter. Along the way, they will make some special tests on the ice. This will be part of a research project run by scientists that will see how the ice of the Arctic drifts along the top of the seas in the area. There is a lot to do to prepare for such a trip. These people are making food for the explorers, but it's not just any old food. It has been specially made to give the men as many vitamins and as much nourishment as they need to keep them fit and healthy during their long journey.
The men also need to prepare their bodies for the trip. They must be very fit to haul those heavy sleds and they are here in the gym lifting weights to build their muscles. They also need to get used to the conditions that they will face in the cold of the Arctic. The closest they can come to this is by camping out in a big freezer. Imagine doing that for any length of time. Playing tug of war with one another is another way of getting their bodies fit for the trip. It would be just like having to tow one of those heavy sleds over the ice. They also have to practice their skiing skills because they'll be doing a lot of that in the months to come. A helicopter will be there to take them to their starting point and then it's off to the wilderness until they reach their destination in Canada. Here is an example of the kind of tent they'll be living in for their time on the ice. Looked rather small, didn't it? They will take a computer and a satellite telephone with them to keep in touch with everyone at home. They will also use them to call for help if they run into any trouble. They will also be able to tell people about what's happening each day in daily updates on their website. Good luck, fellas. A rare mandrel monkey has been born at the Moscow Zoo, the latest addition to the mini monkey boom for the Russian capital. And he's a good guitar player as well. This one month old baby mandrel monkey was too busy playing and discovering his mother's feet to notice anyone else at the Moscow Zoo. The eight year old mother still carries her newborn around everywhere with her, but soon the monkey will be able to walk on his own. Moscow zookeepers say they believe he's already made it through the crucial period and hopes that the rare monkey will now have a healthy, long life of about 25 years. His nine-year-old father looks on with a yawn and the monkey keepers say that they're pleased that at least he seems to like his new son. The mandrel is the largest type of monkey and is an endangered species. So this little baby is a very special addition to the zoo. Mandrels are baboons, which come from Western Africa and are easily identified by their enormous heads. The zoo has only one concern. Mandrels have more than one mate, and this one has a very jealous first wife, who holds the dominant female spot in their family. She lost her newborn last year, and perhaps because of this she's been extremely jealous of the new mother and her baby. The first wife chases the young mother around the cage and sometimes tries to bite her. It's a life on the run for the mother and her son. They pick up corn from the cage floor in the middle of a domestic dispute. Zoo officials are watching the young mother very carefully. They won't interfere with the squabbles unless the baby is in danger, and so far they haven't had to worry. They say that it's very important for them to learn to accept one another and raise the child together. Meanwhile, a new baby has also appeared in the neighbouring cage. This six-week-old Goreza Colobus monkey is the latest addition to this small family. The newborn, the zookeepers aren't sure if it's a boy or a girl, keeps close to its mother, but has been born in a more peaceful family. These monkeys often care for each other's children, and in this small family, there seems to be no rivalry between the two mothers, each of whom now have one child. Things are looking good for this baby, especially when it's got such a great mum. 